there's nothing like the comforts of home. The Steelers haven't left the confines of Akrasher Stadium for three weeks now. And it's been time well spent. Contenders in November, baby. Let's go. Win on three. One, two, three. Win. With a win, Pittsburgh would move to two and one during their homestand and continue to be in the thick of the AFC North race. Green Bay has failed to win at the confluence since 1970. And after snapping a four game losing streak, they hoped wins would start to stack in their favor. We're gonna go out, dominate this game. We're gonna deliver this game to still a nation. And then we're gonna quietly walk out that locker room like we do every week. We don't say nothing. We just go out and do it again. Today we go off. You hear what I'm saying? Today we go off. November is the time for contenders to take off. And there is no better runway than right at home. Here we go. This pass is caught and that's a touchdown. That's the way to work. Come on. He's been that sack. The Steelers win the football game. Let's go. Come get it. You know what it is. This one is in the history book. Here we go. Welcome to the 84 Lumber Mike Tomlin Show. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the 84 Lumber Mike Tomlin Show. I'm Missy Matthews. The Steelers have made a habit of winning ugly this season and heading into week 10, their final of three straight home games. Many wondered if it would eventually catch up to them. But last Sunday at Acrisure, Pittsburgh brought its run game and stout red zone defense, resulting in a 23-19 win over the Green Bay Packers. And for more on their sixth victory of the season, let's welcome in Bob Pompiani, who's standing by with Coach Tomlin. Guys. All right, Missy, thanks very much. We're here with Head Coach Mike Tomlin. Fitting, the alumni weekend came, and you had sort of a throwback kind of performance with all those rushing yards. That's back-to-back, 166-206. Best two game total since 2007. As a head coach, you must love that when you see those kinds of numbers and how it's working. You know, um, I like the fact that we're controlling the line of scrimmage. It's, it's November. And as I tell the guys, you know, the road starts to get narrow. And, and one of the chief ways of remaining on the road is, is winning the line of scrimmage, um, being able to run the ball and, and manage your possession down circumstances. And on the flip side, uh, being able to control the run uh, and manage your uh, circum uh, third down circumstances that way and so no doubt excited about about the recent trends. So both of your running backs had big days of course but it was interesting because Najee Harris said after the game he thought the MVP was the offensive line. What's happened since Broderick Jones has been on that O-line? You know I, I think his addition has been a component of it. Uh, he brings an energy. Obviously he's a talented young man that's why we drafted him in round one. Um, but I also think it's just kind of um, the cohesion developing in the collective. Um, we missed some time early um, over the first half of the season. Um, Dan Moore sustained the injury, missed some time. James Daniels sustained the injury, missed some time. Um, and so coupled with the presence of, of Broderick and his talents, I also just feel like as a collective, we're starting to absorb the type of collective experience that allows us to perform consistently. I know what you expect from Najee Harris. You see what you get from Jalen Warren now. It seems like every week, and he got his first 100-yard game, uh, a big moment in his career. Yeah, I don't know that anything that goes on with him has been surprising. And I say that because we see what he puts in day to day. Um, he's just an extremely hard-working and hyper-focused young man, and, um, and good things usually happen for guys like that. On the other side of the ball, once again, you continue to make plays when you need to make them defensively. The plus minus in that department is among the tops in the game. Uh, is that the main message uh, as you get later into the season? Because you see teams losing all the time by making four turnovers, three turnovers a game. Hey, you know, we got a desire to be dominant and stop everything. Um, but based on our current state, you know, um, it makes it difficult, you know. We're missing some key kind of central you know, communicators, hubs of communication at the end of that football game. You know, we were in there without Cole Holcomb and Quan Alexander and Minka. And, and those are guys at the second and third level that do a lot of communicating. And so um, create some tight moments and some challenges from time to time. And, and so um, we better remain vigilant about getting the ball because people are going to have an opportunity to make plays on us. 
uh, from time to time, just because in some instances we're not as uh, cohesive as we could be if we had those frontliners in there. So what do you do now in the absence of both those guys? Uh, there were some big plays last week. Green Bay, I think, had eight over 20 yards. Who, how do you, first of all, strategy-wise, knowing you don't have Holcomb or Quan Alexander, but also from a personnel point of view? I think first and foremost, we got to do what our guys can do. Um, we have to acknowledge that we're going to be playing some guys that are new. Um, and so um, the prep week is big, and what they're able to display knowledge of in prep uh, is going to be big. Um, and forget the nameless great faces that we play. It starts there first. Um, we got to be able to execute the things that we call. And so um, when you're playing with new people, that's what you do. Just like in the front part of the season, we were missing people in the offensive line. Um, James Daniels and Dan Moore, like I mentioned, uh, we did what was appropriate in that regard. So I don't want to let you go without asking about Danny Smith. The guy's a warrior. He's on the sidelines after the game. You didn't see what happened. I'm sure you have by now. How's he doing, number one? And the guy keeps getting up, and he never missed a chew. He kept chewing the gum. Um, it's been a non-issue. Um, to be quite honest, I can't believe how much attention it's gotten. Uh, people get splattered on the sidelines in the NFL every weekend. One thing I don't want to stop talking about is the health of uh, Pat Fryermuth. He seems to be ready to come back. How much have you missed him in the offensive pass part of your game? It's really significant. You know, you talk about matchups on the interior parts of the field. Uh, people are able to um, play split safety defenses and put a lot of pressure on our outside receivers. And so um, balance is good. Uh, it's good for all parties involved. It's good for a guy like Kenny that, that has to distribute the ball without. Well, it's all old man on deck weekend as a Steelers head to Cleveland, take on the Browns. Second meeting of the year. What's changed with Cleveland since the first time the Steelers saw them? We'll talk to Coach Shamlin about that and a big matchup in Cleveland. That's all coming up a little later in the broadcast. Missy, back over to you. Okay, thanks so much, Bob. And a big difference for Week 11 will be the Browns' starting quarterback. Rookie Dorian Thompson-Robinson will be taking over for an injured Deshaun Watson. Still to come later in our show, Merrill Hodge is back with a playbook to explain how Najee Harris and Jalen Warren have helped to reignite the Steelers' ground game. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the 84 Lumber Mike Tomlin Show. Direct snap, and here it is. He wants to throw it. He does, and he throws it up to the third, and it's intercepted on a tip with that football. Alex Highsmith to the goal line. Touchdown, Pittsburgh, on the first play. A 30-yard intercept return by the young man out of Charlotte. you got to be kidding me. This is the way you come out of the gates, baby. You come out at a full sprint. you got to tip ball. you got to juggle it. And then you got Highsmith coming along, showing great athleticism. Picking that pigskin up, up the air, and then trucking that baby in for a touchdown. Throws that pass over the middle on a dead run. George Pickens, he's at the 40, 35, a man falls down, 25, 20, 15, 10, Pickens, touchdown. 71 yards for George Pickens from Kenny Pickens. Whoa, my, whoa, Nelly. Play action fake, he's back. There's and Alex. the ball is out and it's going to yes. pick it up. And that's T.J. Watt running for the end zone. Steelers with the touchdown. The strip by Highsmith and his bookend buddy Watt scooped and scored. And the Steelers take the lead. Their second defensive touchdown of this game. That's that what we need right there. That's we need, baby. That's how y'all lead. It's been a strange game. It's been a defensive game. The Monday night magic continues for the Steelers and Mike Tomlin. And that, of course, was a look back at the first meeting between the Steelers and Browns this season. It was week two, and it also marked the third loss for Deshaun Watson against the Steelers in his career. This week, he won't have a chance to improve his record because earlier this week, the Browns announced he was having season-ending surgery and that rookie quarterback Dorian Thompson-Robinson, a fifth-round pick out of UCLA, would get the start over P.J. Walker. For more now on Cleveland, let's send it back over to Bob and Coach. Guys. 
Hey, thanks, Missy, very much. It's the Steelers and the Cleveland Browns. Uh, big game, both teams 6-3 and three in a very competitive AFC North. And, Coach, I want to ask you about, uh, first, their win last week. They came back. They were down big in that game, and they made significant plays late in it to get a win at Baltimore. Yeah, they, they, got, a, they got a top-notch defense, a, a group that's capable of creating a splash of their own. Um, and it was evident in that game. Uh, we got a defense that's playing like that, and you got a defensive player of the year candidate like Miles Garrett, who's making seemingly making game-defining plays week in and week out, very much like T.J. Watt, for example. Uh, you got a chance to be be in a lot of circumstances and and make the type of runs and comebacks and so forth that we saw last week. It's not just him; it's their secondary, very good one led by Denzel Ward. Uh, what have you seen differently since the last time you played them? Got a win here at Acrisure. I, I think. Um, you're seeing more of the same, to be quite honest with you. They were they were a really good defense in week two. Um, maybe the football world didn't recognize it, but those of us in the business recognized it. And um, you know, the same things that made them tough then, they're doing now, and they're doing even even better. Um, they're really stout against the run. Um, they're really schematically sound versus the run. Can't say enough about the things that Jim Swartz is doing there. But he's a veteran. Uh, play caller on the defensive side of the ball that's been in the NFL over 25 years. I'm not surprised um, that he is positioning a very talented group strategically well. Um, I think those guys have a better understanding of what they're trying to get done as a collective, and thus they're making more plays, they're playing faster. But I think the same could be said about all teams, the difference between week two and now. And so from that standpoint, it's the same. Your run game has flourished. Their run game Obviously, Mrs. Nick Chubb, but they haven't gone away from their identity. It's been Jerome Ford mostly. So have you seen a continuation of what they like to do, regardless of personnel? They, you know, taking nothing away, obviously, from the uh, talents and exploits of Mr. Chubb, but like as significant as he is in their run game, so is their offensive line coach, Coach Callahan, uh, in that front. And so um, although I'm sure they miss Nick Chubb, you can see statistically they haven't suffered a lot via the run, and it's because of Coach Callahan uh, and that quality front that they have up front. They probably got one of the best, if the not, if the not best guard tandem, for example, uh, in the game, and I think that's kind of reflective. Um, Ford's doing a really nice job for him. Um, Hunt's back in action for him, and, and, and obviously he has, has experience uh, within that system and, and with those guys as well. So they're missing Jack Conklin. They continue to do it. Um, Willis has been out too. So do you do you attack the the tackle position a little bit, knowing that it's more inexperienced than what they used? To? We attack anyway. <laughs> you know, um, seriously, um, that's why we put the type of resources we do in the outside linebacker position and acquire players like T.J. and Highsmith, and over the years James Harrison and Lamar Woodley, and uh, the list goes on and on. Um, we value the edge component of play. We are always in attack mode regardless of who plays tackle. And with Amari Cooper, and specifically Njoku, they like to attack the middle of the field. How the responsibility there is shutting those yeah. guys down? Um, those re the reputation of those two precede them. Precede them oftentimes. People drop schematics, particularly in situational moments, to, to minimize those guys. And I think rapport with the other guys and, and, and spreading the ball around to some supplementary guys. And that's probably a little bit different than we played them in week two. They had Peoples Jones on their team in week two. And so the subtraction of him also means, you know, a spreading of the ball around some other eligibles. I'm really interested in seeing um, Kareem Hunt's um, involvement in the passing game. Um, prior to this year, he was a significant component of the passing game. Uh, his inclusion in possession down football and screens and so forth was a big component of what they did. And so um, interested in that as well. Uh, but some of the changes just have to do with the evolution and uh, of of a, of a unit over the course of a season. Season losing people due to injury or or trade, like in the case of Peoples Jones, um, and so that's what you're looking for. It might not be developmental things, players ascending or descending. It's just a group doing what it has to do based on the you know variables given to address a certain week. It's AFC Road North action, or North Road action. However you want to do it, you know what kind of game it's going to be. It's the Steelers and the Browns. And when we come back, Missy, we're going to have the keys to this game. Both teams 6-3. and three. Back to you.
Thanks, guys. The Steelers are 2-1 and one so far on the road, and Sunday will mark their first of two straight AFC North matchups away from home. They're closing out their second half of the season with five of eight games on the road. Coming up next, how can the Steelers continue to lean on their run game? Merrill Hodge breaks it down for us in a brand new playbook. Now it's time for this week's Yin's Chat trivia question. Who had the most tackles in a game versus the Browns? James Ferrier or Jack Lambert? Find out after the break. Welcome back to the 84 Lumber Mike Tomlin Show. Your Yin's Chat trivia answer is James Ferrier. Each week, answer Steelers trivia and make game day picks for a chance to win signed helmets, jerseys, footballs, or even a trip to the 2024 NFL Draft. And don't forget, if you answer the day's questions correctly, you can get double the points. Just log into the Steelers mobile app now and play. When Coach Tomlin was making a list of what members of the Steelers offense to introduce to the crowd against the Green Bay Packers, he decided to go with two running backs. They, of course, are Najee Harris and Jalen Warren. And over the past two games, Pittsburgh is the only team in the NFL to have multiple players rushing for over 150 yards or more. For more on what's working, let's send it over to Merrill Hodge. Hi, everyone. Welcome into the UPMC Rooney Sports Complex studio for the playbook presented by AccraSure. Now, every time I start talking about the running game, everybody's like, oh, because you're a running back. Ah, that's partly true. The other reason I know the value of it in helping you win games consistently in the National Football League and the way the Steelers have built their running game over the last month has actually been incredible. They've added man blocking schemes that have really helped. And these zone blocking schemes have gotten better. So we're going to start with the man blocking schemes first. What I love about man blocking schemes, we call it a pin and a pull. So that means you have offensive linemen get angles. So they're coming at angles at guys versus straight off the ball. Individual blocks, tight ends on the outside. So you get good angles initially. Then you get a puller and you get matchups on linebackers. So with all of these blocks working and being executed, that means your runner has unbelievable running lanes and options. So as we clear this and we let it unfold, you'll see what it does. Now, anytime you can create a running lane like that, see the angle blocks, they've pinned, they got a wall here. They got a dig out here with the guard on the linebacker. You'll love that. Your tight end has done a beautiful job on the outside and your wide receivers even playing a role. That's all critical in being su successful in the running game. So this man blocking scheme they have done so well on has been very productive. Jalen Warren, Najee, great job of complementing it. Now let's go to a zone blocking scheme. Now a zone blocking scheme, they actually struggled with this earlier, but they're getting better at it. That means guys have to work in unison together, see things together. So that means the wide receiver over here, boy, he's gonna have to work to get his block. Tackle's gotta widen, he's gotta get a block. Guard's going to have to widen with the tackle and receiver, and you're going to have to work on these three guys right here. Now, the real tough block, which is done beautifully, is your center has to scoop here. The guard has to work with him so that you can block the down lineman and this linebacker. So that is not easy. That's a little harder to do. It takes a team that, gets, that works well together, and they're starting to do this better, too. As you snap the ball, look at this beautiful thing. They not only get a running lane for Najee, I mean, they get people blocked, they get people scooped. I mean, right there you can see the running lane that Najee has. I mean, that you can't ask for anything more beautiful than that right there. But you got blocks on the outside, you got a seal there, you got a seal here, you got dig outs there, and you got what I call a canale. That is a big time running lane for the back, and Najee hits it at full speed. The running game is the only phase that can help both sides of the ball, offense and defense. If they keep running the ball like this, this will play well on the defensive side as well. And if this becomes a foundation, they got a great chance to win this division. 
And you can catch much more of Merrill's playbooks on the Steelers' official YouTube page. Well, Sunday will mark the 25th regular season meeting between the Steelers and Browns in Cleveland. Pittsburgh is 26-6-1 in those games, and it will also mark just the third time since 1980 that both teams are three games above 500. A lot is on the line in this one, so let's get your keys to the game presented by your neighborhood Ford store. Here's Bob and Coach, guys. All right, Missy, e, thank you very much. Let's talk about the Cleveland Browns. They're playing at home. Those people up there are pretty passionate. I know your number one goal is to try to get that crowd out of the game as best you can. Yeah, but we expect them to be there for 60 minutes. Um, I think probably it's about us just getting acclimated to these AFC North road venues. Um, we've played two AFC North games. We've played them in the confines of our home venue. Um, it is a significant step uh, to step into these hostile environments and and perform and perform in significant one-dimensional moments, possession downs, two-minute, et cetera. Uh, really exciting to get the group in the stadium and, and, and watch us grow in that way and, and, and pursue victory. Last week we saw an NFL record. Six games go down to the final kick of the game. If it comes down to that again, I sense you feel pretty good about Boswell. I think a lot of people sometimes take him for granted for what he does because it's so automatic with him. I don't know that anybody in our building does. Um, he's a veteran. Um, he's highly consistent. Um, he always wants it. Um, he, he's got a six sense of humor. Sometimes he wants to take a delay a game and back it up five, you know, <laughs> uh, just to put a little heat on it. Um, but you want a guy that's wired like that. Um, he's done it at a high level for a long time, man. We appreciate his efforts for sure. Well, it probably will come down to that. Coach, all the best in Cleveland. Thank Should you. Should be a rugged AFC North game as per usual. I want to remind you, we'll get you started tomorrow morning at 11.30 a.m. with our pregame show. We have two hours of postgame afterwards. Bryant McFadden will join me for that. That's on KDK+. Plus. In the meantime, thank you for joining us here. For Missy Matthews and head coach Mike Tomlin, I'm Bob Pompiani, and thanks for tuning in to the 84 Lumber Mike Tomlin Show. We'll see you again next week.